Um, so thank you all for bearing with all of the technical difficulties while we kicked those space aliens out of the room. So this book, Between Certain Death and a Possible Future, came about when I realized there was a missing generation in AIDS literature and cultural politics. Usually, we hear about two generations. The first, coming of age in the era of gay liberation and then watching entire circles of friends die of a mysterious illness as the government did nothing to intervene. And now we hear about younger people growing up with effective treatment and prevention available and unable to comprehend the magnitude of the loss. We're told that these two generations cannot possibly understand one another and thus remain alienated from both the past and the future. But there's another generation between these two, one that came of age in the midst of the epidemic with the belief that desire intrinsically led to death and internalized this trauma as part of becoming queer. I'm a part of this generation. We share experiences with both of the more commonly portrayed generations. Maybe we are a bridge between them. This is my sixth anthology. And with every new project, I always start with an open call for submissions that I circulate as widely as possible so I can bring together the broadest range of perspectives. When I was writing the call for submissions this time, I was careful not to impose specific dates on the generational frame, because I knew this would vary depending on a wide variety of factors, including race, class, gender, religion, ethnicity, rural or urban experience, regional or national origin, HIV status, and access to treatment and prevention over time and in shifting contexts. I knew that any generational frame only offers a partial truth. So I didn't want to impose artificial boundaries. I wanted to put out the idea and see who responded. I originally thought of this anthology as including anyone who came of age sexually in the midst of the AIDS crisis before the advent of effective treatment. But one thing that happened as soon as I started reading submissions was that the scope of the book expanded to include some people growing up well after the emergence of protease inhibitors, but still experiencing the feeling of growing up between certain death and a possible future. To me, an anthology is an intervention. My goal is not to create a definitive text, but to inspire more stories from even more angles, to facilitate even more conversations, to deepen the analysis, to complicate the narratives. As I was working on this anthology, I was flooded by my own memories so many stories that I'd almost forgotten, hovering at the edge of my awareness. Like when I was 19 and I drove cross country to move to San Francisco. What I remember most from that drive was stopping in a rest area somewhere in the middle of the country where I'd never been. Getting out of the car to throw out my trash and while I was stretching, the rest stop attendant came out wearing orange rubber gloves that went up to his elbows and he pulled my trash out of the garbage and put it in a giant blue plastic bag that he immediately tied to dispose of elsewhere. You need to leave, he said, or I'm gonna call the cops. To be a 19-year-old faggot at a rest area in so-called middle America in 1992 meant you were a threat. What if someone got AIDS from your trash. In San Francisco, I found the dykes and fags and gender bending weirdos and other outsider queers like myself. We needed one another to survive the world that told us we deserve to die. We broke down every day in every way. 
but we believed we were creating something else. We needed to believe in order to live. In San Francisco in the early 90s, AIDS was everywhere. And now I realize how much shutting off was required to exist in day-to-day -day experience. You couldn't express shock at everyone dying right in front of your eyes because shock felt like a form of cruelty. So you would act like everything might be okay, even when nothing was okay. You met some queen on the street and she was showing off her lesions in a campy way, and then she was dead. You went to the beach with a group of people and some boy was flirting with you. And then you were asking around about him. There was that look in his eyes and you wanted to see that look again, but he was dead. You slept with someone you knew was positive and he wanted to make it romantic. So we lit candles around the bathtub before you got in together. And a few weeks or months went by and you wondered what happened to him, but he was dead. I didn't go to memorials because I felt like I didn't have a right to be there. I felt like I would be stealing other people's grief. And this is a generational story too. We were coming of age in the midst of all this death, but we felt like it was not ours to mourn. If there's one thing I want this anthology to do, it's to open up the possibilities for feeling, for feeling everything. Grief is not something you can steal. You can silence it, yes. And I think that's what our culture has done. Dominant culture, gay culture, queer and trans cultures. The grief has become internalized and the consequences have been devastating intimately, interpersonally, culturally, and communally. In this anthology, there are 36 essays from an expansive range of contributors. I could have included many more. Every time I read through the book, I find myself getting emotional in surprising places, even after the work has become so familiar. I can't predict what you will feel, but I can predict that you will feel. Maybe it'll be grief or rage or loss or laughter or longing or curiosity or inspiration, empathy or craving, expansion or contraction, devastation or catharsis, connection or confusion, revelation or confirmation or all of this at once. Let's talk about everything so we can feel everything. Let's feel it all so our future remains possible. So thank you all for coming tonight and for switching platforms with us, switching dimensions. Um, let's have a round of applause for all the contributors and for everyone in the audience. Virtual applause, bring it on. Feel free to um, comment as much as you want in the chat. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first contributor here tonight. Nels P. Heiberg is a professor of English and Modern Languages at the University of Hartford. His literary work has been nominated for a Pushcart Prize and appeared in journals such as Concha River Review, Writing Light Review, Duende, After the Art, and Intima, a journal of narrative medicine. In 2020, he received an Artistic Excellence Award from the Connecticut Office of the Arts. Please welcome Nels P. Heiberg. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us um, as we migrated over here and um, everything. So I will read about half of my um, essay in the collection, Open 24 Hours. So. Get the book, you can see the other half. Um, I'll dive right in. Adult bookstores made, made me the gay man I am today. Perhaps that sounds hyperbolic, 
but my experience in these spaces had the greatest influence on the attitudes about sexuality and identity that I currently hold. After growing up in a small town of about 5,000 people in South Texas, I moved into the University of Houston dorms in August 1988. Over the next five years, I read a lot of books and sucked a lot of dick. All those years and all those men, and there's probably one fact that is the most unbelievable. I never swallowed. I don't use never to mean rarely. I mean that I never did it. I turned 19 and approached college life in the city knowing what AIDS was. I was even able to understand the difference between the syndrome and HIV, the virus itself. And I was terrified. AIDS equaled death. I would see it with my own eyes. The thing was, everyone else felt pretty much the same way. I became a top because my mind kept my own ass clamped. HIV could not enter if the door was always locked. My mouth, however, was open. I described first night at a bookstore seeing a porn film um, of two guys in a van, which also was the first time I ever saw two men kiss in any media, in life, or anything. After watching the guys in the van, I stepped into the hallway. A bearded man in a cowboy hat smiled at me. I followed him into another booth, and I kissed a man for the very first time. He invited me to his apartment about a mile away. The first night I saw two men kiss was the first night I kissed a man, which turned out also to be the first night I would ever roll a condom down my own incredibly erect penis and engage in anal sex, whereupon I experienced the biggest orgasm of my life, and the first not caused by my own hand or the mouth of that one guy a year earlier at Free Enterprise and Christianity Week at Dallas Baptist University. It was a big night, all thanks to an adult bookstore. <clears throat> October, 1991. I swung by a bookstore on the edge of downtown on a Wednesday night, turned a corner in the hallway and saw a man at the end standing with the booth door fully open, the light from the TV illuminating his face. He smiled at me. He didn't reach for his crotch, tweak his nipples, or wave me inside. He just smiled, bulbous cheeks up against his glasses and a little shine off his balding head. I stepped in and shut the door. We kissed, turning our heads in different directions, and never thought of unbuttoning or unzipping anything, even with moans and slaps of skin against skin emanating from the porn around us. We exchanged numbers in the parking lot, but it took a few weeks before either of us called the other. I'm not sure who called whom first, but we developed a pattern of eating cheap Chinese food and watching used videotapes from Blockbuster. One night on the couch, he told me he was HIV positive. His lover of three years had died of AIDS a year earlier, but Blaine waited to get tested until after the funeral. I asked about his doctor, and he told me things were good with his health. It didn't occur to me to stop seeing him. If anything, it finally made sense why he wasn't interested in pursuing anal sex and was happy with hours of making out in bed or in the couch or in the car. On May 15th, 1992, we stood with a few dozen friends for what the African-American woman from the city's gay church who was officiating called a rite of blessing. We had grocery store sheet cake and a CD playing The Nightingale by Julie Cruz, written by David Lynch and Angelo Badalamente, and performed by Cruz in the premiere episode of Twin Peaks. A coworker from the photography gallery I worked at took so many photos of everyone and everything. Friends gave us wine glasses and soup bowls and butter dishes. Blaine and I went to bed in his condo that night, both exhausted, but his exhaustion didn't improve with rest. He stayed in bed for days. Every couple of days, he asked me to lower him into the empty tub so he could fill it only after I left, his spine growing more prominent as the days passed. I called the number on his jury duty notice to say he could, wouldn't make it. The woman kept telling me he had no choice. I finally blurted out, he has AIDS, and she hung up. I think Blaine put all of his energy into making it through the ceremony and I was too wrapped up in our preparations and finishing the semester to notice any changes, 
too self-absorbed or naive or young to ask questions. Yeah, there was the emergency room visit in April when his cough turned out to be thrush, but a couple of prescriptions later, he was fine. I never understood what all the pills in the bathroom were really for, but I made sure he followed the directions. In June, Blaine called his mother and brother when I was at the gallery. They showed up to take him back to Pennsylvania. Blaine told me, I made a promise to myself that you would not stop your life to take care of me. My mother and stepfather drove up from my hometown the day before Blaine flew out to Pennsylvania. I said goodbye as fast as I could. He was still in bed. On Saturday, July 12th, 1992, I called Blaine after my mother and I had gotten home from church. His brother's wife answered, oh, no one's here. Blaine died this morning and everyone's still at the hospital. His mother never said not to come to the funeral, but she did tell me it was going to be a Catholic funeral in a Catholic church several times. The obituary his brother mailed to me said Blaine died from pancreatic cancer. The funeral itself was on July 15th, two months to the day after our rite of blessing. I asked that he be buried with his ring. His mother sent it back to me. Thanks, Matilda. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for that beautiful reading, Nels. Um, I've become discombobulated. Usually I'm so poised here. I'm like, where are my bios? I've lost the list of bios. Let's see. Well, I might just have to say, oh, I know, here we go. I've got it in the book. Our next contributor here this evening um, is Baron McKenzie. Baron McKenzie has crossed the virtual border. That's one advantage of these um, readings online is you can cross borders without so much interference. Baron is an award-winning freelance playwright, writer, actor, and producer. His writing credits include Bloodbath at St. Paul's, Fashion Police, Meet the Months, and Jones in, as well as his two full-length plays. Get Off the Cross, Mary, and NGGRFG. Now there's a new update in the bio that if I find it, but Baron can tell us all, update us, please. Please welcome Baron McKenzie. Yay, we made it. Um, I just want to say thank you, Matilda, and uh, thank you to uh, Women and Children First, Thank you to everybody that's hanging out and is sticking around to uh, listen to these very important stories. Uh, congratulations to um, my fellow contributors. Um, and um, yeah, so here we are. Uh, this is my story, Hockey Night in Canada. Edmonton, 1984. I am underage and working in the gay bars. Randy is a waiter. I am a busboy. Randy is bearded and into leather. I am small and effeminate. I'm told I look like a girl. He has a laugh that fills the room and his eyes dance with mischief as he chases men around the bar. Randy is always having sex and I am jealous because it isn't ever with me. Randy gives me a key to his apartment so I always have a place to go. He sleeps in and I clean up while watching soap operas and the Oprah Winfrey show. One day I hear Oprah talking about the gay cancer. Her guest is a man with purple marks on his face. You are going to die of that. I push the thought out of my head and take the dirty dishes to the kitchen. One day Randy asks me to meet him at his favorite restaurant at four in the afternoon. He has to tell me something. He is drunk and has been crying. I have it, the cancer, the gay fucking cancer. As he speaks, I can see the same purple blemish on his temple that the guy on Oprah had. I reach across the table and grab his hands. He cries and drinks until he is falling out of his chair. I ask for the check and take him home. The next day he is up early. 
He is cheerful and resolute, like nothing is wrong. I need you to take care of the cats. I'm going to travel. New York, San Fran, and Boston. I'm calling it my screw you tour. I'm gonna fuck my way across America and I'm gonna give it to everyone that gave it to me. I am left alone in his apartment for a month. I am lonely and depressed. It all starts to sink in. He is going to die soon. I can hear it in his voice. Every time he calls, he sounds weaker. I can feel the walls closing in on me. Everyone I know and care about is now getting sick. Randy phones me late one night, wasted. I'm coming home. I'm ready. I light candles in the bedroom and change the sheets on his bed. Randy looks so different from the man who left a month ago. He has lost most of his body fat and his face looks like a wooden puppet. The purple splotches are everywhere. I sit him on the edge of the bed and take his hand in mine. Sleep with me. Have sex with me so I can die with you. His eyes flash with rage. Spit flies out of his mouth as he screams inches from my face. You selfish fuck. You have everything going for you. Look at me. Look at my face. I'm covered in fucking lesions. You are pristine and young and smart and beautiful. Where do you get off asking me to kill you? Get out. Get out of my fucking house. He kicks me out of his apartment and refuses to see me again. I am bussing tables at the bar when one of Randy's fuck buddies tells me that he is dead. I am 16 years old. Vancouver, 1994. The lesions on my legs keep moving up. The sores cover my feet from the tips of my toes to just above my ankles and show no signs of stopping. I have nerve damage and my feet are hypersensitive to the touch. Even a bed sheet brushing against them makes me scream out in agony. The specialist says that it's because the AIDS virus has nowhere to go. So it is settling in my extremities, feet first, hands later. His main concern is to control the pain and stop the spread of the lesions. If he can't, they may have to consider amputation. I have been placed on a number of pain pills, but have built up a resistance to them. Now I am on liquid morphine, which I can administer myself every four hours through a shunt in my arm. The doctors don't know about my addictions, cocaine, alcohol, sleeping pills, anti-anxiety medications, Valium, morphine, dilaudid, neocitrin. My trips to the doctor are exhausting and I get into bed as soon as I arrive home. The ringing phone jolts me out of my sleep. I hear a tired voice on the other end. It's time. Tom is whispering. He doesn't want to wake up Billy Boy's mom, dad, and brother who arrived yesterday. Billy Boy's family disowned him after he came out of the closet. They just showed up out of the blue when they heard he didn't have much time left. Tom is an angel who stepped in to help when Billy Boy needed care. They met in Edmonton and moved to, out to Vancouver together when they were teenagers in the early 80s. Tom and I dated the same man at separate times. We became fast friends. If you wanna say goodbye, now is the time. The doctor said he won't make it through the night. The guys will pick you up in an hour. I hear noises in the background that sound like an animal moaning. Tom says he has to go and hangs up the phone. My pain right now is really bad and I have to get it under control before Sandy and the other guys pick me up. I hate taking this drug with me everywhere I go, so I load up my syringe with extra cc's of morphine and push it through the shunt. I pack a flap of leftover cocaine in case I need to take the edge off, and I wait. I examine my bloodshot eyes in Billy Boy's bathroom mirror. I wipe the last remnants of cocaine off the tip of my nose. I look like shit. The familiar feeling of numbness mixed with stinging in my feet is starting to return, which means the last hit of morphine is wearing off. I should have brought some with me. Hopefully I won't be here too much longer. I open the bathroom door and I see the three factions. In one corner of the living room, 
Billy Boy's family sits watching the hockey game. At the opposite end and squished into the dining room are 15 of his closest friends, ranging from my age to the respected old guard of our community, the gaggle of gays. In the middle of the living room, separating good and evil, lies Billy Boy, moaning on the hide bed We've been here for hours. The doctor said he would be dead soon, but Billy Boy is being stubborn as usual. Thank you, Baron, for that beautiful reading. Um, am I back on this? Well, our next contributor, Sassafras Lowry, is a straight edge punk who grew up to become the 2013 winner of the Lambda Literary Emerging Writer Award. Sassafras's books, Kicked Out, Lost Boy, A Little Queer Miss Carol, and Leather Ever After, have been honored by organizations ranging from the National Leather Association to the American Library Association. Sassafras's work has appeared in numerous anthologies and in publications including The Rumpus, Catapult, and Narratively. And Sassafras has taught at the Center for Fiction, Lit Reactor, and colleges and conferences across the country. Sassafras lives and writes in Portland, Oregon, with here partner and the menagerie of dogs and cats. Please welcome Sassafras Lowry. Thank you. And thank you everyone for being here and sticking with us through all the tech issues and for Matilda for putting together this awesome, awesome collection. Okay. Living in New York City, I worked as the director of one of the city's largest LGBTQ homeless youth drop-in and street outreach programs. When I started at the agency, the program I oversaw was primarily funded by federal HIV prevention, testing, and treatment adherence money. I was responsible for the operation of a large federally funded contract that was designed to provide LGBTQ youth experiencing homelessness with resources from organizing street outreach to connecting them with shelter, housing, medical care, and GED programs. I also could make sure they got a shower, a new pair of socks, a hot meal, and a snack to take back to the streets for the night. At my agency and every other agency in the city, an HIV positive diagnosis for a homeless queer youth meant access to safer, better shelter beds. If a youth tested HIV positive, the counselors in my program could see them for an unlimited number of case management sessions until they went to the doctor. And after that, they had to end sessions with the youth who they had built a relationship with. The assumption by the government was contract was that if we could get HIV positive youth housed before we had to close their cases, the government would pay the agency more money. This was funding for a drop in center to work with quote unquote vulnerable populations. If a youth tested HIV negative, they could have no further government funded sessions with my team, regardless of how many years they had been on the streets, regardless of their risk factors, regardless of whether they were in crisis and begging for help. The youth I worked with were mostly between the ages of 17 and 24, and they knew how the system worked. The reality was if you were HIV positive, there were going to be more resources for you, more benefits, and a quicker path off the street into better accommodations. I am not suggesting that homeless queer youth are intentionally seroconverting, Though over the years, I did meet and speak with youth who felt this was their only available path to resources. When you are freezing on the streets of New York in February and have no possibilities for shelter that feels safe, what are your options? This was 2010 to 2018, and HIV was everywhere. The longer I worked with homeless queer youth in New York, the rarer it was for me to meet cis gay male youth or transgender young women who weren't HIV positive. I was reminded of my own experiences as a homeless youth in Portland a decade before in the early 2000s. 
how none of the kids in my suburban GSA were HIV positive, but a large number of the street kids who became my best friends downtown were. A not infrequent part of my job as a program director was sitting down with young homeless queer people who had just gotten off buses to New York City from other states, often in the South. These youth came to New York without a plan, without connections, or rather the plan they had is they heard there was community in New York, that there were resources for them that didn't exist in their conservative cities and states. It was devastating to watch youth slowly over the days and weeks realize the limits to what contemporary LGBTQ community in New York looked like and how few resources there really were. On a personal level, to be the face of an organization that could only provide limited resources and support, I felt like a failure. This wasn't what I envisioned envisioned when as a homeless queer teen, I dreamed of growing up to be a program director. This overwhelming sense of failure ultimately led to my burnout, disillusionment, and, and dis departure from my job and my nonprofit career. In large part, because I didn't believe that it was possible to actually do anything other than apply in an adequate Band-Aid to a community bleeding out. I felt like I had become part of the problem, not a solution. While there are significant resources in New York for queer youth experiencing homelessness, living with HIV and seeking medical care, Sorry, while there are significantly more resources in New York for LGBTQ youth experiencing homelessness, living with HIV and seeking medical care than would be available to them in other parts of the country, there are not enough. And unfortunately, the majority of resources are reserved for youth who are the sickest. Youth know that. They know that to get a private room in a shelter or their own apartment, they need to be sick enough. I was told that when your option is sleeping on the streets or on the train in warehouse shelters where your belongings get stolen and you get beaten up, getting sick doesn't sound so bad. The youth I loved and worked with were sick in ways gay people blocks away in the gentrified West Village of New York no longer had to experience. For these youth, lesions and wasting syndrome were still common. Just blocks away, HIV was now portrayed as an inconvenience, a disease that you prevented or treated. For youth who lived on the streets, HIV still felt like a death sentence. The only benefit was it came with housing and food. Today, queer youth still make up a disproportionate number of all homeless youth. The best numbers tell us 40% of homeless youth identify as queer, LGBTQ youth of color, as well as transgender and non-binary youth are more highly represented amongst homeless youth populations. According to the CDC, youth make up 21% of new HIV diagnoses in the United States and are the least likely of any demographic to be connected to medical care. As someone in my mid-30s who grew up amidst homeless queer youth culture and then spent the better part of a decade working with and on behalf of queer youth experiencing homelessness, I cannot be silent when I hear the pervasive narrative that young people do not know the impact of AIDS. When we say that HIV is no longer a death sentence, we erase the reality of some of the most marginalized members of our community. Homeless queer youth are still dying of AIDS, and a lot of people simply do not care. Thank you, Sassafras, for that beautiful reading. Thank you, Berend and Nels as well. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Now we have a little time for um, questions and conversation. Um, if anyone has questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, and maybe uh, Baron, Nels, and Sassafras, if you want to come join me, um, maybe we can all chat together. I think I might be spotlit. Am I spotlit? Um, or are we here? I'm still spotlit. Um, maybe, Quinn, would you mind bringing all of us on so we can be spotlit together, if possible? But yeah, if anyone has a question, throw it in the chat. 
and I want to mention also, um, I have a few more readings uh, coming up. This is, of course, a tour for uh, Between Certain Death and a Possible Future. So um, the next one will actually be the Canadian virtual launch, which will be on November 1st as part of the Ottawa um, International Book Festival. And then after that, we'll be at Karis Books in Atlanta, one of the other few feminist bookstores still left. Um, that will be, um, oh look, here's the tour uh, uh, in the chat. So, okay, so I'll just stay spotlit and then, um, yeah, I guess, yeah. So, but yeah, if anyone uh, has any questions, put them in the chat. Um, one thing I was thinking about while listening to each of you was about uh, the role of homophobic and transphobic families in each of your stories. Um, so in Barron's story, there's Billy Boy's family. Um, in Nell's, um, a little later, there's Blaine's family. Um, in Sassafras, there's, of course, your own family and the families of all of these queer and trans kids. Uh, living on the street. And I wonder if each of you, or if any of you um, have anything you want to say about that role, right? That continuing role of homophobic and transphobic families um, and how that intertwines with your experiences of the AIDS crisis. If anyone wants to say anything, feel free to unmute and um, join in. <laughs> sure. I mean, yes. The, I mean, yes. I think that the, you sort of spelled that out there, that for sure there is a huge intersection um, with the violence of the, you know, heteronuclear family system, right? And the way in which that system has, or in these families systematically, have often and continue to, despite all of the, you know, advancements in, you know, recognition and assimilation of queer culture, continue to enact violence on um, LGBTQ people of all, of all ages and youth in particular, right, who are particularly vulnerable to familial violence. And I think it's impossible to talk about um, HIV and AIDS in queer culture without acknowledging the ways in which families have historically and continue to um, be unsafe, unwelcoming places for queer youth, either directly shunning them um, and adults or making, you know, being unsafe, unwelcoming places where people rightly choose not to be part of. <clears throat> I, oh, sorry, Nels. Do you want to go ahead? Go ahead. Um, I, 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 um, at first, when I first started going to funerals and, and, and we would be excluded, um, and pushed away or rejected from the people that we were considered family who were dying at first, that was really, that really affected me. Um, but by the time this story happened, it was just so normal. And we found as a chosen family to work around the family. And there is a character in here that um, I, I think in, later on in the story where I say, I go to get him to help us at Billy Boy's bedside. I don't really like him, but moments like this make us uh, kind of band together. And that's really what my experience was, is actually as much as the families tried to separate us, it actually brought us closer together. And uh, it made us want to fight for the right to exist in the death space as, um, as if we were family ourselves. And I'm, I'm thinking how um, at that time, the silence imposed by the family, there was nothing to do about it. I mean, you know, reading Blaine's obituary where it said he died of pancreatic cancer. I was like, well, what do you, <laughs> I mean, there was nothing to say. And I, I think, um, I know for me, and I would bet for a lot of us um, at a certain end of the generation, 
I, I partly do this work to document um, or to, to break that silence and to say, no, this is, you know, this was Blaine. This is what he um, did die of. And, you know, and I noticed throughout the whole collection, um, not just me, but lots of people use very specific dates. Um, and I know that we are very interested in the truth. Um, and even though I think a lot of us can question what the truth is and, um, you know, we know that at the same time, it's like, okay, but this person was real and lived these dates and died in this way. Um, and I think a lot of that does start with the family and wanting to just break that silence, um, that is so naturally imposed. Oh, I love that. And I love that you mentioned actually that that detail about how people do in the book mention very specific dates and that kind of specificity. And I think another way that specificity plays out is geographically, right? So even like here tonight, we have, um, you know, Baron is writing about Edmonton and Vancouver. Nels, you're writing about Houston. Sassafras, you're writing about Portland and New York. Um, and so, yeah, I wonder if anyone wants to comment because I think that's a really interesting point you bring up, Nels, about that specificity and also about that range and the ways that the experiences across all these wide barriers sometimes, right, of geography, of uh, time and place and space, how the pieces still intermingle and create a kind of conversation with one another. I wonder if anything resonates about that and if anyone wants to speak to that. Yeah, um, Barrett. I, it, I mean, it's so important because uh, you know, when Randy was dying, we weren't allowed to mourn. We weren't allowed to acknowledge even that people were sick. Um, that's why I find your, the opening to this book is so important. And it, may, it, may, it makes me cry every time you read it. It was so important. Like, I have survived now. I have survived generations of being HIV, watching friends die, watching families turn us away. And for the longest time at sort of after the after philadelphia came out and and angels in america came out it's almost like even me as an hiv positive person at that point just wanted it all to stop and to just move on with my life try to get out of addiction try to do better for myself and i don't want to hear about aids and hiv and death anymore but now the thaw has started to come out. And I think for me, it's so important. It's almost like me marking in a book saying I was here. Sorry. That my friends who were here, they existed. And the dates, and the dates that they died mattered and what they went through mattered. And that's why I'm really grateful for this book is because it made them matter for the first time since their death. Mm, thank you, Baron. And of course, feel free to cry and bring out all the emotions. I'm just so grateful to have that emotion here and, to, and thank you for the comment about how my intro makes you cry. I feel, for me, like I say in the intro, I really want this book to open up those possibilities to feel everything. And so we can all express like all of our complicated experiences that I think have been silenced over the last few decades. Um, and I think Nels, did you have something you wanted to add? Well, I, yeah, I, I'm seconding all of that. And then I would add, um, I know with mine, it actually did start out, um, I had part of a draft about adult bookstores before I saw this call because I wanted to document those spaces. Um, because there was the part of me that was like, um, no, you're not gonna knock these places over and have them erased because they were a part of our queer history. Um, they were, I mean, you know, they need to be documented, debated, all those things. Um, you know, I say in, in the piece how in Houston, they were always just outside the most conservative neighborhoods. Um, and I think that, need, you know, things like that need to be said. And so there is that, um, yeah, the, you know, breaking silence, documenting, um, just saying that these places existed, these people existed, um, rightly or wrongly, what people think were happening in these places. 
things were happening there, good and bad and, um, you know, life, death, all that stuff. But, you know, holding on to the facts and um, yeah, finally just documenting and getting out all this stuff. Yeah, I think that's a really important point because I think actually in all three of your pieces, there is this theme of talking about the spaces and places that are considered outside of respectable society, right? So, you know, we have bar culture, we have um, the culture of adult bookstores, we have the culture of the streets, right? And so these are all cultures, especially in the, you know, in the decades that have passed, where we're not supposed to be existing or talking about those anymore. And so I think that's like, that's a really important point. I see there is a question in the comments, which I feel like um, has maybe been addressed, but let me read it because it is really eloquent. I really resonate with Matilda's comment that it didn't feel like the grief belonged to her. For me, I've found that as the years pass, I've become more and more aware of the people who I never got to meet because they died. It is a really weird form of grief because it is communal rather than individual. How do we navigate this? So that's a different angle. So does anyone have thoughts on how do we navigate this communal grief? Um, you know, in, a, in a certain sense, that is what the book is about, right? Bringing all of our specificities, like each piece is wildly different in terms of its outlook and style and sometimes even form and perspective. Um, and, um, but as a whole, it is in a sense about that kind of communal conversation but do other people have thoughts on um, navigating or expressing that communal grief? Baron. I just don't shut up, apparently. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think that, that for me, it's all about having the, um, give, being given the permission. At first, it's about give, being given the permission to speak. And then it's also about, as Maxine Waters would say, claiming my time. I mean, I talk about the AIDS epidemic with people that uh, are uh, look very shocked, very confused, very never went through it because I think it's it's now that I'm I'm a survivor of it, and now that I've survived that time, and because for so long I was unable to speak the truth about what I experienced. Um, now I, I see it as one of my living amends and my living commitments to the people that I've lost that I will never let people forget. And so for me, this type of thing just makes it a safe space. This is a complete safe space to talk about that. And a book like this gives us, it, we are all communicating together with this book and we're also communicating with the people that are reading it. I think that's a perfect ending. I don't want to keep anyone too long. I know we had to navigate two different virtual spaces. Uh, we're all in our different cities. But I want to thank everyone tonight. I want to thank Baron, Al, Sassafras, Quinn. I want to thank Women and Children First. I want to thank everyone who joined us and came with us over here. And <clears throat> maybe we can just close by a virtual round of applause for everyone please. Um, and maybe we can have kisses. <laughs> Love to you all. Quinn, if you wanted to come back, feel free, or we can all just say goodbye. And hugs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, not sure how to show myself right now, but just want to thank everyone for um, bearing with us. This literally never happened. So don't let it discourage you from coming to future um, events. Thank you all for being so patient and helping me troubleshoot and try to work this out. Um, this was beautiful. You guys are beautiful. Thank you so much. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye. Thank you.